afternoon. Um, it's 2,500 years since uh, Plato first wrote about gender equality, uh, but it was only in 1852 that Charles Fournier coined the term feminism. All that to say the history of gender equality is long and progress has been very slow. But uh, one of the advances that we've seen in the last few decades is more and more men embracing feminism, and that's what we're here to talk about today. Feminism is for everyone. And I'm joined by four fantastic panelists who I'm going to introduce to you now. Uh, the first is Peter Wang, Managing Director Asia of Iron Mountain. I could impress you with his biography, or I could really impress you by revealing that he used to be a rocket scientist. Uh, when I asked him three words to describe his brand of feminism, he said full-time daddy, part-time executive. Our next panelist is Dr. Brenda Allegri. She's a lecturer at the University of Hong Kong. She's both an activist and a killer soprano, but rarely at the same time. And her three words to describe her brand of feminism are decolonizing, inclusive, and intersectional. Nicole Chow is uh, head of e-commerce Greater China at a company called Facebook. Um, <laughs> sounds great. Um, she was the second employee in the all of Greater China. Uh, and her three words to describe her brand of feminism are diversity, valued, and equality. And our final panelist, uh, a man who needs no introduction, but we'll give him one anyway, uh, is Brian Henderson, who is the COO of Baker McKenzie and chair of the Male Allies. Uh, you can read his bio in your own time. What it won't tell you is that in 2015, he was crowned Hong Kong's indoor rowing champion. I know, I know. He rows outdoors as well. I've seen it. Um, I, I want to dive straight in with some questions, if I can. The Male Allies conducted some research uh, earlier this year. One of the shocking statistics that came out of it was that 60% of men don't think that gender equality can benefit men. Peter, what, what do you think contributes to these fears, and how can we tackle that? So, Adrian, the, uh, the, uh, the stats are really shocking, but um, in my experience, they're real. And I've got the, uh, the battle scars to, uh, to show for it. So I, I think for me, it comes down really to people being afraid of the unknown or things that they don't understand. Uh, and somehow, by doing more to help the women, uh, some men feel like uh, they're going to get less, right, or they're going to be worse off. Uh, and, just, and it's something that we really have to acknowledge that this exists and, and really tackle. And, and an example that I can give is uh, earlier this year, uh, for the first time in our company, in my company, uh, we launched a DNI uh, program in Asia. And the centerpiece of that program was a mentoring program for, for women uh, in our organization. And as you can imagine, many months of work went into it. Uh, we were very, super proud, you know, small team, super proud of what we uh, came up with in terms of the design of the program. And I took the opportunity to announce it uh, at an offsite that was attended uh, by folks, uh, senior folks from my company um, from, from Boston, which is where you know, the headquarters of uh, Iron Mountain is. Um, and so we announced that you know, th this was uh, what we were going to do. And the first few questions were really around, uh, and some of these questions came from the folks from Boston. Uh, and they were you know, basically saying, well, you know, I, I, are you sure the men in the organization are not going to be unhappy about this? Uh, and so I remember you know, hearing these questions. And, um, and so the first thought was, you know, you know party pooper, right? <laughs> like, we, we've spent so much time, and you know, this is really a great program, and this is what, what, you know, what, what you're asking about. But actually, in hindsight, that was the, one of the best things that could have been said, actually, because it, if it's the perception and the behavior that we're trying to change, and a lot of that is, is on the men, um, you know, the, the worst thing to do is to kind of right off the bat uh, do something that will further alienate you know, the folks that we're trying to change. So we did go back to the drawing board. We still launched the same program, but we made it inclusive. So both men and women uh, had the opportunity to both uh, you know, contribute and also benefit from the program. So it's been you know, very successful, and I, I'm really glad that that feedback was given, even though at the time I, I really thought that was uh, inappropriate. Nicole, how about you? So uh, I believe gender equality is for all like uh, public awareness, including men and women. So uh, we definitely need men's support on this. 
And personally, I'm very passionate about this. And we actually think that, like, um, when women succeed, like, um, th everyone actually get benefit because, like, it, they will actually contribute back to the society and help the society to get better. And one perspective is uh, we can actually think of cognitive diversity, where, like, um, uh, thinking uh, from uh, people actually have different thinking from different ways. Uh, from people with the different backgrounds, like uh, experience and information. So it actually, so at the end, we be, I believe like, like it actually benefit to the society because it helps society and, bo and also companies to generate uh, different ideas and also get things done uh, better together. So and um, so at Facebook, like we have a saying that when uh, women succeed, we all win. So uh, the reason is simple, like uh, from the economic perspective. So we are seeing uh, around the world and in Hong Kong, many and more and more women are actually setting up their own business and pursuing their own dreams. So, and we think uh, because of that, like we, uh, three years ago, Facebook actually uh, started to run a program called She Means Business. And uh, uh, we are very proud that uh, one of the founding members is actually TWF. Mm -hmm. And since then, we have trained up uh, more than 2,000 women of, of female entrepreneurs in Hong Kong. And then we also actually help them to build up their own networks. And we think that, like, uh, because of doing that, we help them to see more opportunities for them, and then they could be more confident on what they are doing. And at the end, like, they will be contributing back uh, with the societies. So that's why, like, I think uh, in every stakeholder in the society will be benefited on that. Congratulations. That's amazing. Um, one of the other surprising statistics, uh, Brian, is that across age bands, both men and women think that equality in the workplace means that family life may suffer. Um, do you think increasing workforce participation for women really necessarily means that family life must suffer? Thanks. Can I just say I'm so happy to have the uh, pink microphone today? <laughs> <laughs> Um, and the other thing I just wanted to, to note in passing before we go on is uh, Adrian didn't get time to introduce my brand of feminism. For me, it is, uh, that it's not the women that we need to fix. So I think the first couple of stats that you've heard are kind of classic examples of where the issue really lies. It, it's all around those expectations and, uh, uh, and norms that we all set each other. Um, in terms of family life, um, you know, I come from the UK. Uh, I've lived and worked in Paris as well as uh, seven years now in Asia. Um, but I can only talk really about my personal family experience. So, um, you know, my mum <coughs> was a working mum. She was a nurse and a health visitor. Uh, and she worked uh, part time around uh, like our requirements as kids. We were kind of embarrassingly now, we said to our mum once when she asked us, you know, do you want me to be at home when you come back from school? And we were probably teenagers by then. We said, yeah, mum, it's really nice having you at home <laughs> when we're <laughs> back from school. And, you know, she, she worked around that. Um, she did confess to me at one point that you know she really wished um, that she'd had the opportunity to go on and become a doctor. And she's a very smart woman, and she could have done that, but you know society at that time didn't really allow for the spouse, the wife, to be more educated, more powerful, more high earning than the than the husband. So she didn't push for that. Um, but it didn't make our family life any worse. We had a great family life, and we were so proud of our mom, and she did some amazing stuff. Uh, working in downtown Belfast at the height of the Troubles, with all sorts of other stuff going on, which was quite extraordinary. Um, my sister runs her own business. She's got a small son now, seven years old. Uh, she has a wonderful family life as well. She's a super role model to her little boy. Um, my wife also worked. I mean, she worked much longer hours than I did when we were bringing up our kids. Uh, she was working at a, a full-time boarding school, and she had to be there from 7.30 in the morning till 9, 9.30 in the evening. Uh, and, you know, I, I did the long commute, she had the short commute, and we somehow managed to make it work. Um, you know, and our kids tell us that we brought them up to believe they could be whatever they want to be because they saw my wife in that sort of role model position. So no doubt that was hugely enriching for, for our family. So just a few personal anecdotes as to how having working mums in the family is definitely not detrimental in any way to, to family life. None of those women, by the way, had any domestic help whatsoever, especially not from me. <laughs> How about you, Peter? Full-time dad. Yeah. 
Um, so I, I grew up in a, in a traditional kind of Chinese family uh, in Hong Kong. And, and what that means is, uh, you know, my, my father worked and brought in the, the money. And um, he um, never set foot in, in the kitchen once. And uh, and probably didn't know which school I attended. Um, whereas my mom obviously, um, you know, looked after the family, my sister and I, uh, and um, you know, did everything that she could to make sure that we, we grew up in the in the best possible way. Um, but didn't have much say in terms of a lot of the big decisions, you know, in the in the family, including you know how the money is spent and all that. So, uh, and, and it's interesting because even now. Um, uh, it, it, when we have family gathering, um, you know, they, they would, uh, particularly my mom actually, uh, would, would still give us, you know, my wife and I advice on, you know, kind of our different roles in, in the family. So actually this is not a men thing, right? It's also um, a lot of the traditional women kind of think, think that same way. So the preconceived pre notion that, you know, father and, and mother or men and women have, you know, have different roles in the family uh, is, is true, right? It, that definitely exists. Now, I think the good news is it's changing, right? So if I look at, uh, you know, kind of m myself, my wife, uh, our family, um, as well as uh, our friends around us, uh, you know, I, I do see a much more balanced kind of uh, roles uh, between the, the, the men and the women in how they um, tackle kind of family life. So, so I think that's good news, um, but there's definitely more that we can do. Um, and personally, uh, I'm focusing on kind of being a, the right role model. Uh, so one is doing more at home. Uh, my wife is here, so she might, you know, disagree that I, I've, <laughs> I, I've, I've uh, made progress there. But, you know, I, I do try to uh, do more at home. But, but also um, to influence other folks, other men uh, in my organization to, to do the same. So, for example, you know, yesterday I took the morning off uh, to go to an information session for, you know, for school for, for our daughter, and maybe a few years ago, I would have put down in my Outlook calendar, you know, client meeting. <laughs> mm. uh, but now I put in information, information session for, for Caroline, I put that in, in bold, you know, kind of capital letters, and I make sure that, uh, you know, the men that work with me know that I'm doing that, and they're doing the same thing, so that it's not something that we should be hiding, we should be celebrating and encouraging that um, you know, we all do the same. The, the only other thing that I want to mention is companies have a role to, you know, to play in all of this um, in, in terms of policy. So an example would be paternity leave, right? So I, I feel like the battle is lost the day that the child is born because two days later, the fathers go back to work. So, who, so you know, that inequality begins very early on. So we, we've got to address that, so. Quite right, quite right. Um, Brenda, I'd love to ask you a question on a slightly different tack. We often still deal with gender equality quite separately from other issues around LGBT. Um, how can we try and bridge that gap a little bit and look at gender equality alongside and involving broader non-binary conversations? Well, for first, um, well, to those who don't know, I'm a transgender woman. Um, someone like me, or a trans pinay, because I'm also from the Philippines. Um, I think some people are expecting LGBT people to come out, always. But it's not our duty to come out. In the same way as we never required um, non-LGBT people exist, uh, cisgender people, you know, straight people. We don't expect you to come out. You didn't, you never went through that narrative of coming out, even the internalization of coming out, right? So that's already like a, a huge chunk of uh, our narrative that's already usually challenged. So if for us to be inclusive, in not just in the workplace, but in society in general, you, just like what you read earlier about my brands on um, feminism, it should be decolonizing, it should be inclusive, and it should be intersectional. So we are part of all of that, you know. Um, we should be included in the conversation, not because you are doing an enumeration of what are the identities in the workplace, mm. but because we don't want to be for, you know, forgotten. We don't want to be invisible. Unfortunately, when policies are, are made and when buildings are, are made or when companies move in buildings, um, some of these policies don't reflect the identities that are also part of the workforce, like a trans woman or a non-binary person or even some cultural identities. Mm. Like we're here in Hong Kong, but we, maybe we have not heard of a Pacific identity like the Fa'afafine or the Fa'afakaleti, 
you know, and maybe they don't recognize themselves as Western identities like transgender. Mm -hmm. And when they're in a Western workplace, they feel that the policies there, as well as the culture, don't resonate with them. So maybe we have to really um, make our, com our, our conversations more comprehensive. And in the process, ask ourselves some questions. How can we be more inclusive? When we feel that like we're all of the same ethnicities, we're all white, we're all men, we're all cisgender, yeah? If nobody's there, you're not, you're not going to do la like a witch hunt or a, a fishing. Who, who is brown? Who is of another nationality? Who is trans? Who's LGBT elsewhere? But maybe we, we look for experts. We look for, we ask for help. Mm. Because there are already policies in some in some countries, you know, like uh, there are also some guiding principles that we can get from, let's say, um, UN, the United Nations, um, different women's groups, not just in Hong Kong but even internationally, and engage the community. Mm. So um, some LGBT people may not be in the workplace because they could not get in the workplace. May it be corporate or academic or different areas, right? Because of the discrimination, mm -hmm. the fear. And if you consider the culture in Hong Kong and in China in general, it's very traditional, it's very patriarchal, and it's reeking with heteronormativity. So we have to start challenging that and you know, removing layers and layers of this oppression so that we can be included in the conversation. And your policy should be more robust to reflect mm -hmm. that. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, a, a question for, for the gentleman here is male allies, um, you'll be sensitive to this, but perhaps some advice for the audience. How can men go about addressing gender equality in a sensitive and sensible way when, frankly, we are so much part of the problem as well? Uh, well, being sensitive and sensible is probably part of it. <laughs> Um, yeah, look, I think uh, there's a lot of denial, as we've heard from some of the statistics that you cited earlier, Adrian. Um, but, uh, you know, if we think back to the stats that were shown at the, at the first part of the presentation on the intro uh, that Fiona did, um, you know, the stats speak for themselves. Clearly, there are a lot of issues, particularly here in Hong Kong. Um, and those are issues that, of course, like women in the room like this, it's fantastic to have this sort of support network and this kind of dialogue and discussion. Uh, but we heard a lot, particularly on that Cantonese panel, about the patriarchy in Hong Kong. I don't feel super well qualified to talk about that, but I do kind of sense it and de detect it. It does seem to be particularly strong here. Um, so I think men have to be part of the solution. Um, so I think m you men we have to encourage men to be curious, to understand what is going on. Um, so I, I think that is work that all of you can do. You know a lot of men, uh, probably some men in some senior positions. Um, and you probably have opportunities just to talk to them about why, why is it, how come, have you noticed that? Um, so I think the women can definitely play a role in encouraging the men to, to pay attention and to educate them as to some of the challenges you face. I think part of our privilege is that we don't see the challenges that women face in the workplace. It's just invisible, we don't experience it, so it doesn't exist for as far as we're concerned. Um, but it's really out there. So I think helping men understand all of that bias that is systemic. So when I say it's not the women we need to fix, it's partly it's the men that need to be educated and have their eyes opened, but a lot of it is systemic, starting from day two of the baby's birth and onwards and all the education. We, we swore blind our daughter would never wear pink, um, but on day two, all the presents started to arrive and they were all pink. <laughs> you know, so that's kind of where we got to start from. Um, and then I think just encouraging other men um, to think and be a bit more um, sensitive to their own behavior. So calling out men who maybe just make an inappropriate remark. I think again on the panel earlier, there was some, you know, the jokey stuff that happens when you think the women aren't listening or whatever, or even if the women are in the room and you know they're listening, you still do the jokey stuff, just not acceptable. So as a man, you have to be brave enough to say to your male colleagues, actually, I don't really feel, it's making me feel uncomfortable. I'm pretty sure it's probably making her feel uncomfortable. Really not appropriate. So having the courage to call that, I think is one of the things men have to step up and do. Mm -hmm. Peter. So I, I agree with everything that Brian just said. Uh, you know, for me, it starts with um, the awareness that there is a problem. Uh, and that is one that, that we need to address. And, um, and so, you know, it's really important to, um, to be uh, well-educated and informed about the issue, the fact that inequality exists and, um, and how we should approach that. 
Um, and, and this is actually, you know, a bit of a plug here, but this is actually w where TWF uh, has really benefited me a lot. It's been a transformational journey for me, uh, being involved in the organization over the past couple of years, uh, where uh, it's really helped shape my view of what the issue is and what are the conversations that we should be having and, and with whom. Um, and in particular, the Male Allies Program, which, uh, of course, you know, uh, both Brian and Adrian part of, uh, sometimes it's, uh, it feels like a bunch of men kind of sitting around a table kind of you know, bashing other men <laughs> about, you know, kind of our, our roles in all of this, this mess. But, um, but it is, but seriously, it's a platform, it's a group of people who I can reach out to and I'm really learning a lot from uh, in terms of the way they tackle the issue in their uh, own organizations and their own lives and what are some of the practice, uh, best practices that I can take and apply in my own uh, situation. And, um, and, and I have to say, you know, this is, it's given me also confidence because I, I think part of going out there and, and leading change is you kind of want to feel like you, you know enough about the topic um, to, to be able to drive that change. So for me, uh, you know, being part of the male allies and really, you know, coming up to speed on, on, on what, what the conversation is uh, has enabled me to, to gain that confidence so that I can go back to my own organization uh, and drive those conversations and then increasingly uh, expanding beyond that now and, and going out to, um, to talk to whoever would listen to me, uh, both kind of professionally and, and personally about, about how I feel, uh, you know, these uh, challenges and, and, and what we can all do, right, as, as business leaders to drive change. Let's talk a bit about toxic masculinity. Um, Nicole, I'd love to get your views on this. I mean, there's been a big drive amongst advertisers, the likes of Link, Gillette, uh, a lot of whom will be large customers, I would have thought. We've been trying to change the narrative around masculinity and how we talk about and define masculinity. Is that increasingly important to the people that you're working with and indeed to Facebook? Uh, yes, we do see the trends coming from like many uh, different businesses, but also at the same time from the NGOs and other institutions at the same time. And uh, diversity is core uh, is our core to our, our business at Facebook. And we actually uh, have made some progress on that by opening up some of our important uh, training courses like managing bias to the public. And uh, a year ago, like uh, we actually um, started to fo uh, found uh, a, uh, a, a lean-in group, which is actually giving like opportunity for women who are interested in computer science and engineering to join force in the communities. And uh, four years ago, like we also started uh, what we call the tech prep. A tech prep is um, a resources hub that we created specifically for um, underrepresented group of students as well as the, their parents. So the main objective is to offer more opportunity and chances for them to access to the programming opportunity. And that will actually help them to uh, uh, grow faster. And uh, we also act, uh, provide additional resources to college-aged women uh, where they actually show interest in uh, computer science. And then we actually help them to connect with the uh, two, more than 250 lean-in circle around the world wow. so that they actually build up their own uh, circles of support. Mm -hmm. So I think these are the things that we are seeing getting more and more. And particularly, I would say, like, um, as a company, like we focus on the teamworks to uh, create ideas that could actually contribute bigger um, impact and positive impact to the society and communities. So, um, uh, as uh, as, a, as Facebook, like we are dedicated to offer like fair opportunities to everyone, regardless of their uh, gender, background, etc. So we are dedicated to continue to uh, advocate on these values together with our partners like TWF. That's great. Yeah. Brenda, what do you think? How can we change conversations around toxic masculinity? 
uh, well, toxic masculinity um, affects everyone because the thing is, society for so many years, for maybe about a hundred of years or uh, now or so, um, has nurtured all of these gendering, you know, these gendered ideas. So basically, the qualities that we want to embody, the qualities we want to see in ourselves and in society, we just added the meanings, you know, by gendering them, like creativity, um, um, artistic. Uh, qualities, you know, strength, cowardness, um, 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 bravery, um, competitiveness, aggression, right? So we add these, um, um, we, to these psychological or behavioral qualities, we give them gender. Mm. So men are supposed to be competitive. They're supposed to be independent. They're supposed to be reliable. And women are supposed to be nurturing. Women are, women are supposed to be caring. We're supposed to be gentle, right? So we, we begin, to be very basic about this, we begin um, by reminding ourselves that what we want to have should be qualities that are desirable for everyone. And these qualities that are desirable should not be gendered anymore. Mm -hmm. So that's a first step in removing the toxicity, you know, of these qualities in the workplace. So maybe if you, the next time that a man wants to cry because he felt bad for an, uh, 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 another employee in the workplace, let him cry, maybe encourage him to keep crying. <laughs> it's, it's okay. It's about time, you know? <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> and then, Brian, you have to cry too. You're CEO, you know? <laughs> yeah. And we need to see more white men cry. <laughs> Isn't it? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, I think, you know, it's just as basic as that. I mean, uh, I teach sexuality and gender as a common core course. And I realized over the years that my, my approach in teaching has to be very basic because when the 17, 18, 19 year old students uh, join our class, um, they already brought with them the, the toxic effects of how they were raised by society, the expectations. But then they begin being empowered by allowing, being allowed to choose what disciplines they want to be in. So when the girls are proudly saying, quote unquote, you know, girls who think of themselves as girls, assigned girls or women, um, when they are able to choose uh, architecture or engineering or mathematics or physics as their discipline, that's, the st that's one step of being empowered already. So now uh, they have to battle each day, you know, um, it's a daily process, not just in the university, and not just in between uh, um, the home and the university, but at home, because their parents are going to add some more toxic ideas to them, remind them of their, their golden duties. So I think we also have to have conversations with our parents. Mm -hmm. So going back to the workplace, we remind ourselves of that, you know, so that we don't feel the pressure anymore. So the next time women want to be empowered to take the lead, they want to be brave, well, you have to, because being brave doesn't mean that you have to be a man to be brave. You know, we would not be here if not for people who were brave back in the day, regardless if they were we women or men. Mm. You know, so, and that goes for LGBT. That goes for LGBT people also, because remember, um, some LGBT people identify as men. Gay men identify as men, um, and transgender men identify as men. Transgender women identify as women. Um, some lesbians, ident uh, well, lesbians identify as women. So because of that, we, we look at, uh, at the layers of our experience, and intersectionality is one powerful approach, so that we, it would bind us. It, we would be reminded that we have common struggles, we have common pains, but we will also experience common joys and common victory if we just work together. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Just chip in on that one. So, uh, so my female CFO will attest that actually this white pale male guy has actually cried in her room, um, and she was very supportive and sympathetic and a little bit surprised. But, <laughs> <laughs> um, but I think we need to be a little careful about the toxic and masculinity. You're running that into one phrase because uh, masculinity in itself is not really toxic. Um, uh, I think where it gets toxic is where guys just uh, feel boxed in. So, you know, it's okay for girls to be boyish. Like, my daughter used to run around in cowboy outfits and all sorts of stuff. My son never, ever dressed up as a ballet dancer. Never. <laughs> and he would have got a lot of strange looks running down the street if he'd wear, worn a pink tutu. Um, so, you know, so guys do get boxed into quite a small emotional space, and that can result in frustration. It can result in... Just not men just being out of touch with their feelings. I, I'll never forget this experience when I was a younger student taking my MBA. 
and we were doing this sort of personal development course and somebody asked me to describe my feelings and I just did not have the vocabulary to do it at that point in time. Um, and that, that is where the toxicity comes out when guys don't know how to express themselves and not in touch with their feelings mm. and or they just cannot live up to those macho, breadwinning, hero kind of expectations. That is what I think drives the toxicity in, in the masculinity part. Quite right. Quite right. Um, we've, we only have a few minutes left, three minutes, although I'm willing to bet they're not going to drag us off stage, so take your time. Um, <laughs> Fiona's going to kill me now. Um, last question. I, I, I think one of the, the big challenges in gender equality is, in, driving, in improving gender equality, is simply getting people to take action, getting people off the bench. Um, tell us a little bit about your personal stories of what drove you from you know, supporting the issue to, to really doing something about it. Nicole, maybe start with you. Um, so the, um, this is an annual um, tradition of our company. Like uh, we have an event every year that like called a women at, like that actually inspired um, inspired me a lot from that event. So, like every year we will we'll actually group uh, males and females colleagues together to pledge an action that we have to take action and hold each other accountable on. Like one year I remember that we pledged on that um, um, we shouldn't assume like working mom actually have to leave office on time every day and then therefore reducing their productivity. So like over the course of that year, so we actually uh, constantly check in with each other to see uh, the progress that we made. So that actually inspired me a lot that like, we have to actually hold each other accountable on, on these types of pledge. Mm -hmm. um, well, because maybe I've been fighting all my life, you know, to be accepted, to be treated as an equal, to be included. Um, even it, when the vocabulary was not yet available to me, I didn't even know that I've already been uh, a feminist or a, a womanist or a humanist or a personist, however, <laughs> you know, you may want to label that. But I realized that for like for many years, even when I started working, uh, actually back in university, when I have to apply for a scholarship, I have to cut my hair because I was I studied in a Catholic university where they 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 impose all of these um, prescribed requirements on how we should look like and present ourselves, and that was a pain for me. In fact, a lot of my friends who are transgender already dropped out of university because they don't want to, to, to do it anymore. And unfortunately for them, it's hard already to look for jobs because they don't have a university degree. And even when I had a university degree, um, because I'm trans presenting, I'm woman presenting, I've, exp I've heard a lot of things and I didn't get the jobs that I wanted to have. But maybe what, what kept me going is that I think I'm, I'm just a very resilient and optimistic person, but maybe I felt that no one else is going to help me. You know, and if I don't insert myself in, in the, the situation, if I don't inself, my, insert myself in, in, in that environment, then nobody else would. So I, I managed to insert myself, I managed to speak up, I represented myself, and when I look around, I couldn't easily find someone like me. There are not so many trans or LGBT people in the workplace, at least many years ago. But now I am, when I look, well, I look around, I could see more. Mm. Um, I think this is a big step already. So for LGBTQ Q plus plus A A A B C D E F G people, my you know people like me, just embrace yourself for who you are because the struggle is real and the struggles come in very minute. Um, ways also, things that we don't even talk about. Mm. It can be as big as a, 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 um, a toilet issue or problem, but it can be as small as an email. Oh, no, it's a big problem as well. <laughs> 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 yeah, I'm sorry, but may I just share? Because um, uh, an email problem uh, seemed to be a small problem problem for some people. Like back when I was working at HSBC in the Philippines, I work in HR. Um, so I was already in HR. I was an HR manager. And I was going to use the name Brenda because that's my preferred name. But it's not the name on my passport and my birth registry. Mm. So just imagine for, for people like us, um, all of us actually, but for trans people, uh, we, have to, we have to be reverted back to our um, birth registry. It's like, I'm not a baby anymore. I was done being born. So why are you reminding me of what was I assigned with, 
you know. So they didn't want to to give me that name that I I, I identify as. They escalated this to the to the headquarters uh, or to the head office in in the uh, UK or I think mm -hmm. it was here. And then of course the management scolded at them. So then they, yeah yeah. <laughs> 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 That should just happen in the bedroom, isn't it? You know, so, so they got the spanking, you know, and then, and <laughs> so I, so I realized that if I didn't assert uh, my 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 simple my basic right, just be acknowledged of that name, then that would not even be an issue. And it, it it eventually followed by going to the women's toilet. And when people were questioning why am I going there, because I identify as a woman. So, and then I realized also that some, it's also more painful for other women, you know, maybe cis women, mm -hmm. you know, to also leave us out of the conversation just because of our bodies. So imagine if, if the, there are TERFs, you know, trans exclusionary radical feminists who leave out trans people and non-binary people in the conversation. But what is the basic of that conversation? It's about the body. We live in a society that we are asked to, to acknowledge our genitals. And I don't think we have to show our genitals to prove our worth, right? Mm -hmm. They're waving no time, but Brian, can you do a 30-second version? Go on, go say, on, let's push the limits. I'm let's not see how even going to try and follow that. <laughs> <laughs> must be time up. Um, no, like, I think my, my personal motivation to be here uh, today is that, well, I mean, you heard my story about my, the, the kind of female role models, models in my private life, but uh, I mean, my team at work actually is almost entirely female. All my direct reports who I rely on uh, so much every day are all, pretty much all women and pretty much all Asian. Um, so, uh, you know, I just want to create an environment where they can succeed and be the best that they, they can be uh, and be accepted for what they are. Um, where I started getting into the male allies, though, was um, when, when I started coming along to some of the TWF events and I looked around the room. I mean, today it's a few guys in the room, but back uh, three or four years ago, there was three or four guys in the room. Uh, and that kind of made me a bit cross because I felt like the men were really not playing their part and really ought to be more engaged and interested in this and, and uh, working with our female colleagues to find a better way forward. So that is actually where the male allies came from was, was that engagement with TWF when I had that realization. So that's, that's my personal journey to be here today. Thank you. Go on, Peter, quick. I'll make it quick. So, uh, you know, this topic of gender equality really became personal to me when my daughter was born, right? So it, it, it is, you know, and that's where a lot of the passion comes from is when it's really personal to you. And, and that's actually, frankly, <clears throat> my biggest weapon um, when I try to um, convert other people around me is that they see that it, it really is personal to me, right? When I talk about it, you know, my eyes get red, my ears get red, and it's, it's really that they, they know where I'm coming from. Uh, and, and I think it's quite powerful. And, and everyone has their own kind of personal reason why this resonates with them. So they just need to find it and embrace it and, and kind of spread it to, uh, to folks around, around them. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you all. You've been a brilliant panel.